Welcome to this edition of Cranmer Studies. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? The Lord is our professor and teacher. We turn now to Gerald Bray's Documents of the English Reformation, picking up with the preface to the New Testament by William Tyndale, 1526. Wherefore, concerning the resurrection, he's talking about George Joy's mistranslation. I protest before God and our Savior Jesus Christ, and before the universal congregation that believeth in him, that I believe, according to the open and manifest scriptures in Catholic faith, that Christ, this is Tyndale again, is risen again in the flesh which he received of his mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and body wherein he died. And that we shall all, both good and bad, rise, both flesh and body, and appear before the judgment seat of God. To receive every man according to his deeds. And that the bodies of all that believe and continue in the true faith shall be endued with life, immortality, and glory as in the body of Christ. And I protest before God that our Savior and all that believe in him, that I hold of the souls that are departed as much as may be proved by manifest and open scriptures, and think the souls departed in the faith of Christ and love of the law of God to be no worse case than the soul Christ was from the time that he was delivered his spirit in the hands of his father until the resurrection of the body. Nevertheless, I confess openly that I am not persuaded that they be already in full glory that is that Christ is in or the elect angels of God are in. Neither is it any article of my faith for if it were so I see not but then the preaching of the resurrection of the flesh as a thing in vain. Notwithstanding yet, am I ready to believe it, if it may be proved with open scripture? And I have desired George Joy to take open texts that seem to make for the purpose as this, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise, to make thereof what he could, and to make his dreams about his resurrection go. For I receive not in the scripture the private interpretation of any man's brain without open testimony of any scripture agreeing thereto. Moreover, I take God, which alone seeth the heart, to record my conscience, beseeching him that my part be not in the blood of Christ, if I wrote of all that I have written throughout all my book, aught of any evil purpose, of envy or malice to any man, or to stir up false doctrine or opinion in the Church of Christ, or to be the author of any sect, or to destroy, draw disciples after me, or that I would be esteemed or had in price above the least child that is born, save only of pity and compassion, I had yet on the blindness of my brethren, and to bring them unto the knowledge of Christ, and to make every one of them, if possible, as perfect as an angel in heaven, and to weed out all that is not planted of our Heavenly Father, and bring down all that lifteth up itself against the knowledge of salvation that is in the blood of Christ. Also my part be not in Christ, if my heart be not to follow according to I teach, and also if mine heart weep day and night for mine own sin and other men's indifferently, beseeching God to convert all, and to take his wrath from us, and to be merciful as well to other men as to my own soul. Caring for the wealth of the realm I was born in, for the king and all thereof, as a tender hearted mother would do for her only son. 
continue reading Tyndale in our next session. We turn to Prof. Ed, Philip Edgecombe Hughes on the theology of the English reformers. He's talking in this chapter on the value, necessity, importance of preaching and worship. Now for the properties of a good preacher. What are the properties of a good preacher? As defined by Bishop Hugh Latimer, they are to be a true man, to teach, not dreams nor inventions of men, but we am dei in veritata, the way of God truly, and to not regard the personage of man. Nor must the faithful preacher expect popularity, but rather opposition and hatred, even death. Latimer wrote King Henry VIII on 1 December 1530, take this for a sure conclusion that there where the word of God is truly preached, there is persecution as well of the hearers as of the teachers. This is very early. Cranmer is just a newbie to the royal court. For the world loveth the things that are in the world and hateth things that are contrary to it. All the holy scripture doth promise nothing to the favorers and followers of it in this world, but trouble, vexation, and persecution. There's Latimer very early. In one of the sermons, we are pointed to the examples of John the Baptist and Christ, his apostles. But I pray you, what thanks had they for their calling or for their labor? Verily this, John was beheaded, Christ was crucified, the apostles were killed. This was their reward for their labors. So all the preachers shall look for none other reward. For no doubt they must be sufferers. They must taste of these sauces. Their office is arguere mundum de peccato, to rebuke the world of sin, which no doubt is a thankless occupation. But, Latimer goes on, they must spare nobody. They must rebuke high and low when they do amiss. They must strike them with the sword of God's word, which no doubt is a thankless occupation. Yet it must be done, for God will have it to be done. Now that's something that they don't teach in pastoral theology classes, or Tim Keller would advocate in his peaceful, winsome way, his effort to be kind and charitable to the deniers and haters of God. Again, when preaching on the Christian armor, Exodus 6.10 and following Latimer says of Paul, now when he had done, he set out all his mind. At the last he comes and desires them to pray for him, but for what? Not to get a fat benefice or bishopric. No, no, St. Paul was not a hunter for benefices. He saith, pray that I might have utterance and boldness to speak. For when a preacher's mouth is stopped, so that he dare not rebuke sin and wickedness. No doubt he is meet for his office. Pilkington also emphasizes the need for outspokenness from the pulpit without respect of persons when expounding Haggai 1.12. The preacher, Pilkington says, must not be afraid to rebuke sin in all sorts and degrees of men, as here Haggai did rebuke both Zerubbabel, the chief ruler of the commonwealth, and Joshua, the high priest, chief in religion, and also the whole people outside, and threatens plagues indifferently to all, without any flattery or respect of person. For as God, a most righteous judge, will punish all sins, so must preachers indifferently warn and rebuke all sorts of sinners, 
if they perish without warning, as Ezekiel saith. Well, that's quite the word from the English reformers. We're Margot Johnson's Thomas Cranmer with Hugh Bates, giving us some of the bit of a wonky liturgical story on Cranmer, and he's talked about some of the manual actions. The maniple, that's something that's worn on the wrist, worn by the priest, recalls the ropes with which the knights did bind our Savior's hand, and the stole, the rope with which his tormentors drew his body to the cross, and so on. The symbolism is disconnected, arbitrary, and to our way of thinking, quite inconsequential. The modern worshiper would find it impossible to use. Its value may be readily appreciated for someone who'd been brought up on the code. The general theme of the tract is set by the opening words. The priest going to Mass signifieth and representeth our Savior of all the world, our most sweet Redeemer Christ Jesus, which came from heaven to the valley of misery, this wretched world to suffer passion for man's redemption. And therefore the process of the Mass represented the very process of the passion of Christ. The recurring notes are remember, have meditation, consider, let us have before our eyes. The worshiper is able to participate in the Mass by way of the series of acts of faith and recollection, will not have spent his time in vain. Dom Dix asks, asks very pertinently whether is there is so much difference between faith and devotion of Langford's worshippers and those of Cranmer exhorted in 1548. Above all things to genuine, most humble and hearty thanks for the redemption of the world by the death and passion of our Savior Christ, both God and man, who did humble himself even to death upon the cross for us miserable sinners lying in darkness and the shadow of death, that he might make us children of God and exalt us to everlasting life. If we concede Dom Dixon's point, there is no radical difference between the devotional ethos of the worshipers of the old Latin Mass and those who gathered around the Lord's table in 1552. Grandma, moreover, demanded no change, and it probably never occurred to him that he might do so. His main concern with it was the restoration of communicating attendance, which was intended at a stroke to purge the right of its errors and disorder, and to unite in disconnected ceremonies and symbols within the simple locus of Christ's passion. <clears throat> this was no longer to be recalled one way or another in its various aspects at this point to the right, but concentrated on the moment when, by faith with thanksgiving, the communicant received the sacrament of bread and wine, which Christ he himself had instituted as a perpetual memory of his most precious death and passion. It is, of course, a spiritual eating and drinking. But might not the non-communicating attender at Mass who is following Langford's direction also claim with some justice that he too had been made a truly spiritual communion? And pick up that little bit in our next session. Now turn to... Uh, P Professor Dermot McCulloch on Thomas Cranmer. We're talking about the period of 1539 with the six articles, which was a great loss for Tom Cranmer and the evangelicals. 
the passage of the six articles through Parliament in 1539 and the grant of the royal assent was completed by the end of June. Parliament stood down on 28 June. A day or two later, Bishop Latimer and Shaxton resigned their dioceses or were told to resign, as was inevitable given their outspoken measure opposition to the six articles. However, Cranmer found it impossible to take the easy way out and keep his principles unsullied as they did. There are a number of glimpses of him in the aftermath of the pa Acts passage. The most vivid comes from Alexander Eliseus, the Scottish Lutheran who was all over the place. Once more, describing a scene in the Garden of Lambeth Palace in the early morning, probably 2 July, 1539. Cranmer used William Paget to summon Alicius to warn him to flee. Otherwise, he would be compelled to give his assent to the articles. We see Cranmer trying to spare Alicius his life. But why didn't Cranmer resign like Shaxton and Latimer? Giving Alicius a souvenir, Wolsey's ring, which the king had given to him, the, Archbird, the archbishop unburdened himself of his misery, confusion, and shame. And this will give us an insight into Cranmer's mind. Happy man that you are, said he, you can escape. Would that I were at liberty to do the same. Truly my sea would not hold me back. You must make haste to escape before this island may be cut off, unless you are willing to sign the decree as I have done, compelled by fear. For I repent of what I have done. And if I had known that my only punishment would have been deposition from the archbishopric, of a truth I would not have subscribed. He could have done that. Like Latimer, he confesses his fear and then confesses that he's absolved, even though he's signed. This is a notorious signature of Thomas Cranmer again and again and again. Fanboys skip over these things. Hostile commentators focus and, cent focus and camp on these things. We come from two angles. We appreciate Cranmer for what he did. On the other hand, we don't overlook where he erred and failed following the devices and desires of his own heart. He failed. He confessed that to Alexander Alicius. Of course, word of this is going to get to the continent. Word spreads fast among the academic circles. This is 1539. The Lutherans are fully fed up with the English court and Henry and Cromwell. And Luther is getting word in reports of these. Back, stepping backwards. It is a convincingly Cranmerian piece of self-incriminating candor. Yet it is not the whole story and there are more creditable things to be said. What weighed heavily with Cranmer was his sense of indebtedness and loyalty to Henry VIII. The fear of the face of man yet anxieties. Henry had done so much for the kingdom, ridding it of the superstition and tyranny of the Bishop of Rome, and there was every chance that he might do more in the future. It was particularly important that this feeling was mutual. Henry was sensitive, though, to the bruised ego of his faithful archbishop, 
first to offer him the opportunity to miss the final vote in the House of Lords. He refused this permission. And second, to try to make amends for what had happened in, in Parliament. This took the somewhat heavy-handed form of Henry ordering a reconciliatory dinner in Cranmer's honor at Lambeth Palace. The guest list included Cromwell, the Dukes of Norfolk and Suffolk, with all the Lords of Parliament. It is to be hoped, but it's also unlikely, that the king had the grace to foot the bill. In fact, Henry's plan went badly wrong because one of the noblemen present at the dinner, probably Norfolk, chose to praise Cranmer by rubbishing the memory of Cardinal Wolsey. Cromwell took deep offense at this and, and possibly deliberate slur to his own old service to the Cardinal. Cranmer and others had to intervene in what became a bitter, slanging match between the two men about the former papal loyalty. The honorary dinner at Lambeth with Cromwell, tangoing with the Duke of Norfolk, turned to finish the chapter on the hand of Cromwell in Arthur Innes's Cranmer and the English Reformation. He's been talking heretofore about the closure of the monasteries. <clears throat> Cromwell's commissioners <clears throat> to suspend the bishop's rights of commission. The other was the invention of the tuning of the pulpits. That is to say, forbidding anyone to preach without a license which, of course, was equivalent to ensuring that the one who would be licensed would refrain from inconvenient doctrine, and of explicitly ordering the circulation from the pulpits of specific views of supremacy, papal authority, and other matters, and inflicting punishment for the neglect of such an order. Cromwell had completed the revolution the same year, 1539, which we've been talking about previously, saw the coping stone placed on the edifice, the coping stone should be capstone, on the edifice of royal absolutism by declaration of parliament. That royal proclamation had the force of an act of parliament, but he was not content. He'd resolved on cementing an alliance with the Lutheran princes, and the resolve would prove to be Cromwell's ruin. He trapped his master, whose third wife was now dead, that's Jane, into a marriage with Anne of Cleves. And when it was too late to draw back, the king found he had been tricked as to the lady's beauty and charms. For such a matrimonial expert as Henry, this was just too much. The marriage had to go forward and took place in January 1540. In June of 1540, the minister's head, Thomas Cromwell, fell beneath the executioner's axe. Well, that's the end of that chapter. I've got to get a new yellow highlighter, excuse me. We turn now to this classy little volume by Leslie Williams, The Emblem of Faith Untouched. And she does a very nice, she makes a few mistakes, but it's largely a nice volume. Now we, we're shifting around a little bit in time. We're going back to 1535, February. Cranmer's been on in the Archbishop of the office for almost two years. Um, the act of supremacy, 
of the Oath of Succession and the Treason Act has been passed. In February 1535, this was before the closure of monasteries, 1536 to 1539, all bishops swore to the king as supreme head and officially, by law, renounced the allegiance to the Pope of Rome. Moore and Fisher were again brought forward for examination, and they refused to swear the oath associated with the second act. They were beheaded in July 1535. Though the title Supreme Head offended many, Henry insisted that the title claimed no new powers and left the sacramental authority to the church. Henry could not baptize, marry, impose penitence, pronounce absolution, could not say the mass. He was willing to let the clergy control these things and control the subject souls as long as he could control their bodies and their theology. Another challenging task for Cranmer in the early months of his archbishopric was the royal mandate to visit the bishops in his province of Canterbury to assert the new royal supremacy over them. Bishops hated these visits in general because they were expensive and troublesome but Cranmer was met head on by bishops such as Gardner, who'd been banished from the royal court back to his bishopric of Winchester, and Bishop Stokesley of London, who stonewalled, sabotaged, and humiliated Cranmer. Cranmer's opponents objected in part to his title, Papal Legate. The verbal irony was lost on no one. Cranmer was using the title of all, an already banished power to force the bishops to succumb to his authority. Oh, thank you, Randy, uh, for your note. On November 11, Cranmer announced in Parliament that he would no longer be called the legate of the Apostolic See. Also, some opponents, once again, Bishop Stephen Gardner, who'd been appointed Bishop of Winchester in 1531 and essentially banished from his high position at court, <clears throat> protested against another of Cranmer's title, Primate of All England, a title he gained from royal supremacy and a designation that reflected the ancient hierarchy since the time of Gregory the Great. Although the Archbishop of Canterbury was head of only one of the two royal jurisdictions, York and Canterbury, was that uh, the other being York, Canterbury traditionally held the greater stature Frustrated, Cranmer wrote to Cromwell that he personally would have been very happy if I and all my brethren the bishops would leave all styles calling ourselves rather the apostles of Christ. Although the visitations petered out because of political complications, these power plays eventually led to the redefinition of Cranmer's titles clarifying his duties and responsibilities as the Archbishop of Canterbury. As Cranmer struggled to define his role in the new system, he developed a special relationship with Thomas Cranmel, Cromwell, a rising star in the political ranks. Apparently, Cranmer lacked, this is William saying, the political ruthlessness or deviousness in opposition, whereas Cromwell did not. In January 1535, the king appointed Cromwell a layman as his vice gerent over all the churches and over all ecclesiastical jurisdiction affairs. The vicar general was a new and unique position 
In American terms, he was a rector general over all church matters in England. One of the original motives for this appointment was to bring money into the king's exchequer, which we'll see 1536 to 39 with the closure of 800 monasteries. However, this move also meant that Cranmer was no longer the principal minister in the king's spiritual business because Cromwell now overshadowed both archbishops of Canterbury and York. Cranmer not, bore no resentment at being demoted. In fact, he was released from the untenable position of being called the English Pope. Henry alone held that claim to fame. Thus, with complementary talents, Cromwell became the strong arm and Cranmer the theologian. Quote, behind the action of Cromwell, we can see clearly the inspiration and counsel of Cranmer closed, quote, as they worked together to achieve the spread of evangelical reform throughout England. We turn now to Thomas Cranmer, Paul Aris with Brian Spinks. A few comments here on liturgy, talking about the funeral rites in the Book of Common Prayer. His view was that prayer for the living was alone acceptable in the Reformed Rite. This set the theological agenda for the 1552 revision. Following Lutheran and Swiss Reform practice, the whole service was now to take place at the graveside. Though the procession to the grave with its sentences was retained. Two of the prayers of commendation and all the psalms were removed. The body was committed to the ground, but the soul was no longer commended to God. The introduction to the modified committal, coming from Cranmer's favorite contemporary source, Herman von Weed. The suffrages disappeared, and the final two prayers were rewritten versions of O Lord with whom do live the spirits and the collect from the communion. However, the latter is simply entitled the collect and there are no directions or provisions for a communion service that has been restored in Episcopal Church. Both these redrafted prayers are excellent examples of Cranmer's methods of revision doctrinal changes and dovetailing prayers, weaving them together th through the various components. The final prayer, the collect, follows the communion collect of 1549, but then switches to follow one of the suppressed prayers of the committal. However, reference to the departed's resurrection or acceptance are removed and the whole prayer is concerned with the hope of the living. The antithesis of death of sin and life of righteousness is faithfully preserved. Cranmer and the recent liturgical revision in the Church of England, they now have an alternative service book, ASB 1980. The above surveys of Cranmer's revision of the baptismal and funeral rites in 1549 and 1552 served to illustrate the general claims made regarding liturgical methods, which can be likened to the prudent householder who brought forth treasures of old and new. Bishop Reynolds did precisely the same thing with the general thanksgiving redrafting an earlier Puritan prayer. With the advent of these new liturgical compositions in the Church of England, there have been those who out of love for the forms of the Book of Common Prayer have made rather exaggerated claims for Cranmer and have attempted to trivialize the new rites as those of the alternative service book particularly their language. 
No serious contemporary English liturgical scholar. There are a few whose training qualifies them to be regarded as such would deny that thus far we have not produced a happy 20th century liturgical style. It is sometimes forgotten, however, that Cranmer's new treasures were far from perfect and had to be revised and smoothed out by the restoration divines of 1661. Enrichment, rubrical, and theological it was also thought necessary. As a member of the liturgical commission which produced the GS 898 patterns for worship, it seems to me that the commission has followed reasonably and carefully many of Cranmer's methods. GS 898A expanded acknowledgement and list of sources reveals that Cranmer, that like Cranmer, much of the material has been drawn from existing texts, both Roman Catholic and Protestant, and modified from sources already unofficial but in popular services, and reflecting a 20th century understanding of traditional doctrine. That's a mouthful. Treasures old and new is still an important element for Church of England liturgical revision. You mean doctrinal reduction. We turn now to Jasper Ridley's Thomas Cranmer, his delightful handy volume, talking about the fall of Cromwell, 1540. We've already alluded to that. Picking up here as we close this chapter for our last reading in this segment. Nor was there any other point on which Cranmer persuaded Henry to make further advance toward the Reformation in the summer of 1540. And the six articles had been passed in 1539, which was a major setback. It is therefore clear that Cranmer's victory was a defensive one and that he persuaded Henry to reject a proposal of the commissioners to issue a document which took a backward step and repudiated some of the doctrines contained in the bishop's book. Perhaps on the issue of justification, he did have a fight with Henry on that 1538, 1539, 1540. He was substantially Lutheranized, Cranmer, that is, at that date. It was a great achievement for Cranmer to succeed in maintaining during the crisis of 1540 so many of the gains of 1536 and 37. And he had, as usual, performed his duty in giving his honest advice to the king, even though his advice was often unwelcome. On this occasion, however, his advice was accepted. If it had been rejected, Cranmer would have obeyed Henry's decision and enforced it again, the lapdog theory of Cranmer. For all his stiff standing to his tackle, to which Fox refers in his conducts context, Cranmer subscribed to transubstantiation in the King's book, as he had subscribed to the six articles and punished those who defied the book. Cranmer survived the crisis of the summer of 1540 only because of the protection which Henry always extended to him. As with most other events in Cranmer's life, Henry's constant support had been interpreted both favorably and unfavorably to Cranmer. The critics have attributed it to Cranmer's complete subserviency, that's my view, and suggests that unlike Wolsey, Moore, Cromwell, Norfolk, and Gardner, Cranmer alone was never in disgrace because he alone was entirely submissive. The admirers of Cranmer believe that it was due to Cranmer's outstanding virtues, 
which compelled even Henry, for all of his vices, to recognize that Cranmer was a better man than himself and to love him in consequence. And that view is also held here. He was compliant, complacent, submissive. It was real politique. And Henry yet still loved him for his otherwise outstanding virtues. So it's both and. Both of these explanations must be rejected, says Jasper Ridley. Far from being subservient, Cranmer, for all his unquestioning loyalty to Henry and the principles of absolute monarchy, was less subservient than most of Henry's subjects. It's equally difficult to accept the alternative explanation of the sinful Henry being moved to appreciate the virtues of Cranmer. Some 15 years before, when Henry had walked in the garden with Thomas More, with his arm around his neck, More, More told his friends that Henry would cut off his head without hesitation if this would win him a castle in France. In 1540, Henry would have cut off Cranmer's head, or probably have burned him, if he could have obtained any advantage in doing so. He retained Cranmer as his archbishop, while he had no use for the outspoken reformers like Barnes and the Latimer. It was advantageous to have Cranmer in the council and convocation as a counterbalance to the power of Gardner in Norfolk, and as an advocate of modern reformation, who would be useful if Henry in the future decided on further advance in this direction. Cranmer remained in office not because he was exceptionally subservient, but because he was a learned reformer who was sufficiently subservient to make it possible for Henry to retain his services. We don't quite buy that, but let us close. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? Who will lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. We'll be back later today. Godspeed.